some public policies have been initiated, but the reality remains that Latin Americans, or Latin American countries are tremendously unequal countries, most of them. And that blacks and browns and indigenous people still are overrepresented at the bottom of those societies. But I would maintain that a debate, a public discussion has begun in Latin America that takes the issues of racism, racial discrimination, racial inequality seriously, and that the prospects and possibility for greater change exists. And I'm optimistic that we're going to see continued black political activity and political and continued uh, progressive political change. So why don't I stop here and then we can have a little discussion. Yeah, it's open for discussion. Questions, comments? Please. No? Okay. Well, I think. These brown bags are for that. If something's unclear, or you have a, a question, or you want to challenge, or you said that, you know, that doesn't make sense, explain, you know. That's what. <laughs> no questions, no comments. Sheena. No. To me. She always has questions in class. I can't Please, believe Please, just be comfortable. Don't <laughs> forget that we professors who think we're talking about a subject that you're interested in. Please. Yes, that, that's a very important issue, and I'm glad you raised it. Um, Cuba has been experiencing tremendous economic difficulty since the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, the transformation of Eastern Europe, uh, trade deals and arrangements and aid that Cuba received from the Soviet Union. Eastern European countries was reduced dramatically and the trade is cut off. That had a tremendous negative impact on the Cuban economy, increased inequality, increased poverty, and increased desperation. Prostitution had been outlawed in Cuba. The revolution outlawed prostitution. And everyone saw that as a positive development, a good thing. But with the decline of uh, the economic situation in Cuba, many people became desperate. And one of the ways that Cuba decided to revive the economy was through promoting tourism in a, in a big way. And so because relations between the United States and Cuba are so difficult now, Cuba reached out to Canada, and European countries. And so uh, these countries responded and uh, a tourist relationship was developed. But because of the desperation situation in Cuba, many um, Cuban women, including a lot of Afro-Cuban women, became prostitutes because the situation was so desperate at home, they would be paid in foreign currency, which had more value than Cuban currency, and it became a widespread uh, problem, which people call sex tourism. And so, uh, when I was in Cuba in uh, 2000, with a group of uh, students who study abroad course, you saw many examples of older white guys with young, attractive Afro-Cuban women. And so you just made me think, that, that looks like that might be a situation in which you have a tourist, a foreigner, 
coming down for um, sex tourism. And so it's been a major problem, and uh, there is that racial dimension to it because it's clear that uh, most of the tourists are white, and Cuba has a large Afro Brazilian or Afro Cuban population, and so you see that um, contrast. Often, older white man with younger black Cuban or Afro Cuban, or, and so um, it's been very frustrating for Cuban society because. The government disapproves of it, but it hasn't forcefully outlawed or banned it or, or, or banned prostitution because the economic situation has been so desperate. And I think Cubans have just uh, taken the perspective that people are doing what they have to do to survive. Well, at least that's the response we got when we asked Cubans about, you know, this, what's going on here? They, people are doing what they have to do to survive. And so, as far as I know, it's ongoing, this uh, sex tourism phenomenon. Well, I would say that just like we in the United States have our traditions and histories of activism and struggle to create a better uh, situation, uh, Latin Americans and Afro-Latin Americans have their traditions of struggle and organization and activism. And so I think primarily they drew on their own history to renew the struggle for equality and opportunity. But I think they definitely were inspired by international factors. One major source was the struggle for independence in Africa, which begins in the post-World War II period. And that gets a lot of visibility in Ghana, West Africa in particular and then in the Portuguese uh, colonies in the 70s. Those are, um, those struggles are in the news in Latin America. So they definitely inspire black activists who see black struggling, people who look just like them struggling for their freedom and independence in Latin, in uh, Africa. And so I think the same thing is here in the United States. Uh, they knew about the civil rights movement, the black power movement, uh, and all the public policies that African Americans had gained in the 60s and 70s. And so I think that was another source of inspiration. And I think, yes, there was some interaction. I think African leaders did tour Latin American countries uh, seeking support uh, for their struggles. I think some African American leaders did tour Latin American countries seeking support somewhere in exile in Latin American countries. You remember Huey P. Newton, Black Panther Party? He was exiled in Cuba for three years. Robert Williams, he was in exile in Cuba for uh, some time. And so there, there were those types of human exchanges that were important, uh, sharing knowledge, information, strategies, etc. You talked about, you had a question. Yes. Is 